Father. And I want to thank you for that. You have done this to the amazing of us, but also to the shock of the dictator. Every time we travel to where you are, you know what is castigated back home. That we are here to marinate, but not only to marinate, but we are being funded by the Western powers. And that is not true. Any good thing is not funded by any Western power. And no Western power has even influenced the ideology of the movement of the to us. We are the ones selling the idea to stop the West from funding the dictator. Because I can tell you who I this group. That without the billions, US state is one billion shillings in Uganda per year. And this comes in terms of amaro, in terms of uh, tear gas, in terms of whatever. And this money is an accounting for. But the president has unequivocally told us that these monies that are given to General Ed Kabuta the president, it has no accountability. He used to think that as musicians, you had political parties receiving money to stop a war that will never be stopped. Nobody will stop this. Nobody. And that is a fact. Because we are yearning for change. And change is a fact of life. So we cannot run away from the fact of life. And we are the change we have been battling in India. We are the change for us who are here. And it is important that your capacity your inspiration and aspirations to have Uganda liberated must not be bogged down, and that is the one, must not be bogged down by, by ineptness of, back, of our, our poor soldiers or us who are back home. We must work together. Both those who are in the diaspora and those who are back home. But then we have had the challenge, and I speak this as one of the leaders of the full soldiers, but as also a person who has been on the front line on ground. What should be our interaction? What should be our limitations? Because it is dangerous. To be in the diaspora and in command back home for war, a good general must be on ground. I know many of you are good generals, but you must have some alignment. To have this work, there must be alignment there. Because for us, we have the democracy, we, we, we know the terrain under which we are operating. And that terrain, you can be just advised by us who are on the front line and have liability of public trust. There, is, there, there, are, cha there are challenges we have faced as the secretary. People get involved in activities not sanctioned by us. But of course, for us to support anything that is for change, that has been our stand. Anything that will remove Museveni will have the backing of the National Unity Platform in whatever form it comes. <laughs> but that does not mean for us we are happy. We, have, we are up to something. And what we are up to is what we are organizing and building capacity for. So it is important that we don't break the chain of the capacity that we are building. Ladies and gentlemen, I am speaking with clarity. It is dangerous if we break the capacity we are building. If you mislead a full soldier to an activity that later 
deprives us of his availability for the cause of this, the real struggle and sometimes the people back home because of you not being in touch with all of us use the window of speaking directly to you to sometimes also uh, take it for granted Somebody convinced somebody in the diaspora, I don't want to say names, that they were going to burn down, burn down a certain town. So these people were having all those materials of burning, that could supposedly would burn down town. And they were taking pictures to confirm that they are going to do it. But they were not going to do it. They were only taking pictures for the person in the diaspora to send them the money. Now imagine, the day we will need the money, it will, have, it, it, it will somebody else in Ascarenda will have taken it. The Bible says, Tuzara Nibidi, Tuzara, eh? Tuzara Nibidi Simioi, Tuzara Nibidi Simioi. I want to speak with clarity because this has affected us. We don't want you to be gullible to things that are going to tire you in this struggle. I don't know whether you're getting me. We don't want you to be gullible to go for what will not work to go for lies, because amongst us still, we have people who have not fully understood what we are up to. We have people who have taken this as personal interest. And we are too busy to chase everybody, because we must be focused to remove the dictator. And we want you not to stop empowering us, but you should empower on something that is not a lie. Do not empower the seed and spread on the seed. There is no single individual who will carry out an assault and move to save it in Kampala. That is a lie. That is why we are building capacity to be uh, to have the numbers and overwhelm them with the numbers. And that capacity we are building, we want to assure So we don't want to break that chain. And many times it is broken. Without doubt, there are people in prison because of recklessness and negligence. But this recklessness and negligence was precipitated by our own. And you, I believe you understand what I'm saying. There is a story in the Dominican Republic. Somebody in the diaspora, I'm talking about the Dominican Republic, hired members from the diaspora in an Arab country to go back home and carry out a coup. And at the time they were doing so, this person was an informer of the state. So they empowered an informer of the state in the Dominican Republic. And this informer of the state worked with the full soldiers of the Dominican Republic. And there was nothing they were working for. They were all naked and taken. And that affected the capacity of the people. Now that example should quickly go to your minds. We don't want such scenarios in this revolution. We are the able generals that we have built, that uh, whose capacity has been built by a lower institution, we are losing them to either disappearance, tiring, because we are not organized. Feel always free to interact with 
the Secretariat of Defense he has issues. Because at the end of the day, we are the backstop. Once all those things happen, then we call Benjamin. Benjamin, you have to put on your suit and go to court. Because it will still come back to the national unity platform. There is no day we will wake up and say, eh, Because we want to remove Museveni, but do not force us to align ourselves to what is happening, even if it is wrong. Because sometimes we don't want to live our own in the wilderness. So we move with you. But we should be organized. We will remove Museveni. I want to repeat it here. We will remove Museveni. And you said that he knows it because we don't fear him anymore. We fear the capacity that he has built for 40 years and it is what we are working on. Some of us, thank God, we have conquered the fear. We no longer fear whatever he has been organizing to build capacity. And we are passing on this message to everybody. So our, the full soldiers are a very important company and you should continue to support them individually, those of you who have done it, on the basis of their individual capacities. But do not overwhelm them with duty. Do not overwhelm them with duty. Because even what they can't execute, they will desire to execute it because there's something that comes from the side. So you'd rather keep it cordial, truthful, such that we go forward together. But yeah, we want to move in the same direction because Truth be told, we need to build the capacity. We all know what we are going to do. We all know it. My boss knows it. Benjamin knows it. My deputy president knows it. You also know it, what we are going to do. But we must build capacity. We must not be naive that we are just going to wake up in the morning, go on the street, and it is done. No, we must build capacity. And that capacity we are building will not die overnight. Why we are here is to build capacity. To make sure that the financiers no longer have that capacity to finance the junior. Such that whatever activities we have in stock, we have a lot of activities in stock against the seven. But then there are things we must do before the real activities are carried out. The, the international community must know that if there is ever a fight in Uganda, they fight in the fight. And we must do that maximally. So we want to implore our comrades that the relationships with us back home on the front line should be guided. Some of our people are lost in admiration of who you are being in the diaspora. So they will not tell you what is uh, possible and what is impossible. It is important I know even here there are some foot soldiers in the diaspora. I always see them. Those of you who go out and protest every day, how are you most of them? People say you are my brother. I'm going to play the latest. <laughs> you do a good job and remain consistent. What we are trading in this revolution is commitment and consistency. Do not tire. Do not think that it's going to come overnight. Somebody said you have, we go there 15. Even if you go there 2. Even if you go there 1. That voice you use that day is being heard by another, another, another ear that you do not know. We need to pass on the message and pass it on relentlessly. The more you get involved in removing the service, the more you will understand why we actually need to remove Museve. The more I have been involved in thinking and seeing what we should do is the more I have satisfied myself that I am going to remove Museve. Let's give it the time and thought that we need to give it. Let us empower those who can. I'm very excited to see uh, people in advanced age, our fathers and grandfathers, uh, our ministers, please love to them. It's volumes because it means we even have the wisdom of our elders. We have their backing. Nothing is good for a child to be backed by a parent when they are backing you for a war like we are in of liberating our mother nation. It empowers us, guides us on ground. 
give us the knowledge that we want, that we badly need. Some of us back home are not fully literate. If you can assist in understanding the few core words of our values as a party to these people you come out and interact with, please do so. Because it's going to assist us to align our army and use it for the purpose we all desire to have. I want to thank you for the time. I am a bit of a boss. 15 minutes, I am mad and same time, this is my I have been seeing my boss Joel looking at me and saying, now this man has started speaking the rules. So I don't want to break the rules. But I want to uh, implore you, comrades, first of all, to thank you very much. It is because of you that we look the way we look. Clap for yourselves. Whenever people say, well, look at I smile. Not because we are working with government, no, because we have a backing of comrades who decided that their everyday hustle should be part of the liberation of Uganda and we can forever, we shall forever thank you for that. And the only prize you will have is to come back to Uganda because, because we are people. So we thank you for standing with us, advise us, don't mislead us, because on the ground there, we don't want to lose any soldier for money. We want to be together, rank and file. Because every struggle needs order, needs command, needs control. And for you in the diaspora, we must work together. We are aligned to work together. We must not work in isolation. We must be together. Let's build the ideas together. Let's build the front line together. Let's build the modus operandi together and top of the regime. Let's not do it in isolation. I want to thank you very much for giving me uh, 15 minutes. I know I have used 14 and a half. And I want to invite uh, maybe two, three questions uh, from the audience, and then I will invite Honorable uh, Katana Benjamin to come and also espouse on a very particular subject of great importance. Um, I will take the questions. Um, now you see I have a challenge. That is why we find a problem. Let me begin with my grandfather there, Mr. Mtiala. Mr. Mtiala there is my grandfather. I have not seen him, I have never seen him. I have got the opportunity and I'm glad he's the one who picked me at the airport, sir. Oh, yeah, thank you very, very much, comrade. I'm happy to be here today. Uh, this is our third convention here in the United States. Now, my question is a little bit related to what we covered yesterday, but it's also related to the youth. Um, I was trying to see how that federalism we talked about with uh, Dr. Uh, I forgot his name, but uh, he's sitting over there. How federalism would help the youth to kind of get away from that unruly situation they have in Kampala, move back in the villages and, and be more productive. Do you think that that would be an appropriate way to galvanize the youth to be uh, more useful in the fight against the detail? Yes, another question. Yes, my wife. Yes, uh, my name is Oben and I teach you on the continent of Colorado. And, nice to meet you finally. And uh, my question is, do you think we should wait for the 2026 elections, whatever we do? Are you asking me that question? Should, do I think we should wait for the 2026 elections? Okay, thank you. Yes, lastly. Okay, I will take uh, today's question last. Yeah. Good uh, evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Richard Nyombia. I'm a political analyst. 
Paul, a que fin de por favor, a que fin de dar. I would like to ask you this very serious question so that you can answer that. Then what you say, we need two things. We need a freedom chart that every Ugandan can accept into liberating eternity. The second thing we need is the creation of jobs because the seven system to this day have been in the liberation struggles for over 45 years has not solved the issue of creating jobs. Of which, if we work very well at Freedom Charter, based on an example of knowledge, we can liberate that country. Every time I brought this question forward for the Freedom Charter, it has been crushed. So I don't know what we are after. Because the Freedom Charter itself, if I'm going to give you an example here, one minute. Recently, there was a problem where this tall man killed one of the, 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 the ministers in Uganda. The army was in chaos because for 40 years, Museven has oppressed the country using a system, using Ugandans into a security and military system. He has been paid there for the last four months. I don't know if you know that every soldier in Uganda has been paid because the army was saying, now we are going with the opposition. And the freedom charter is the only way out that we can bring the soldiers on board so that the turn against the very man who has been using us, the soldiers, or the population of the country. Why don't we adopt that policy of the freedom charter and creating jobs? That's my question. Okay. I have been looking so much forward to meeting you physically, Mr. Mayombia Richard. Because of, I have been listening to your presentations online. So I'm glad I have finally met you. And I can only tell you that we will discuss your policy with our team, understand it since we are here. We will afford you the time to understand what you say. Because I want us to differentiate two things. We are in a struggle, there are things that we cannot do. Because we are in a struggle. There are things that are difficult to even implement because they will not allow us for them to kick start. So we should be mindful of what one of the tasks that we want to give to ourselves. But as I have said, uh, our elder, Mr. Mimia Richard, that I've been looking forward to meeting you, we will dissect your views to the latter, such that by the time we leave this conference, uh, this time, we have a way forward on whatever uh, direction you think we should take. So I do not want to reply to the Freedom Charter that I have not read. I do not want to reply to a policy that I have not discussed with you. I will be lying to you. I will be pretending to be intelligent. Yet, uh, how do you be intelligent with what you don't know? So I will, we shall discuss with you. If you need two or three people, we are available. Uh, Benjamin there uh, is fast with a lot of knowledge. And uh, Joey and others, uh, Madame Jolie knows so much about policy. So, uh, if you have that document, let it be part of our program and the secretary to see that we accept it and you are finally comfortable with this program. Um, <laughs> Mutiaba, my grandfather is talking about federalism. Federalism can only work when we have toppled the dictator. So let us media on top of this man. Let us not think about so many things. There is one problem in Uganda. Generally, we are not understanding. We forget to move to you. Make this all these other things to align them. Because what are we struggling for? We are struggling to return the power to the people. And what do the people want? It will be done when they have the power. How will they get the power? Let us remove dictator Yoweri Kabuta Museven. He will steal. And then these policies, this war, we will be sitting in these rooms to be 
discuss direction. Let us focus on the direction of war, overthrowing the system. Yeah. And that is what I believe in, that is what uh, our focus is on, because we are the people have a lot of good things we can do. But we cannot do them when the dictator is still at the helm. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be here and uh, pretend that I don't know what happens. I mean, just did, you talked about creation of jobs. If they are sure, the other day, Joel, my boss, tried to do something in Nakawa. His constituents, to the women, to the young girls and women, something like hygiene, improve their hygiene, they were stopped by the security. In Uganda, parts are taxed according to the parameter laws. But they refuse even and purpose. But they refuse a person who has decided to give a helping hand to a girl child because of the system. So how will you create jobs when even giving out a sanitary pad, you are stopped by security. It's a crime. However, as I said, we should not be negative at issues we will discuss uh, these issues. But on federalism, I can tell you, my grandfather, that this federalism we are talking about, I, I have my own feelings about it, and they are positive, but I don't want to give it time until I'm satisfied that the problem is out of the way. Let us focus on removing the problem. And once we have removed the problem, the systems shall work because we shall have returned the power to the people. And that is true. I know my colleagues, Benjamin and Joel, are very happy that this question has been sent to me on 2026. Now, 2026 is a national calendar. It is not a seven calendar. It is a national. Elections are not from seven. Just like we are saying, it's not the president. Even elections are not his. And we should not be tempted to be chased away from what we are fighting for because somebody is using impunity to do it right. We all know that elections are cheated. We all know what we went through. Nobody would want. I was on the front line from the first day. Joel, so there, I am yet to ask, I have not yet got the permission. But I remember that his ties <laughs> were subjected to, eh, to anarchy and impunity. I'm trying to choose the right words, <laughs> such that I don't describe the side how it was and I don't give an opportunity. But if I use anarchy and impunity, you know what they did to his ties. We cannot run away from those facts. People who are, uh, my brother here, I've seen him for the first time, the journalist, my brother has seen You all know what happened. So nobody would want to be in a process that starts Genome uh, 7. But then that election also put us somewhere. It built the momentum. In, first of all, what did we benefit from the 2021 election? We have the mandate of Ugandans. What we sold to Ugandans, Ugandans accepted, and they gave us the mandate. So today when I am speaking, I am speaking as the deputy spokesperson of a political party that was given power by the people. Nobody will ever take that away from me. So we want the election. And the question of election should not even be pondered up. We want it. Somebody just over, overturned the process. And for the first time, the way they cheated this election, they also, they reached a time when they did not know how to cheat. And they used impunity. That is why by 2020, listen very carefully, by 2020, political parties were receiving billions of money. Do you know why they were paying them? Not for the election process. Because we were in charge of that election process. Who said that we never organized that election? We organized that election. 
he cheated an election that he didn't organize because his election was we are in COVID-19, we shall not have public rallies. Wasn't that his statement? We told him, go bury yourself. There's a word he said, go bury yourself, we will go to the people. And he told us we will not go to the people. You know what took him to stop us from going to the people? The Ruka massacre. 50 people, 54 are on record. Today we are speaking because of what he wants, so the gruesomeness of the election. Should it be our focus now, that we focus on 2026? I don't think so. It should not be our focus. But, we should not run away from the realities of the national calendar. Not that it should be our focus, but it is a reality of our national calendar. You know that same movie, Paul Kawanga, did not participate in the 1996 elections. And the state, I will be very open to you of the information that we know. The state believes that MUP will not participate in the next elections. They believe so, that we are not in the next elections. And you know what they are doing? They are blocking up candidates for the next election. Such that there is the vacuum that is of the NUP is covered by other imposters. And you will hear names and also get shocked because for us we have some of the names. And you should be very careful. That is why for us as the secretariat, as leaders, we are tactical and keenly looking at the turn of events as they turn. We cannot wait for the 2026 election to liberate our people. That would be very wrong of us. Can I repeat that? We cannot wait. Our timetable is not to wait that we wait for 2026. No. But we must not arm the dictator that will run away from the national calendar. It is not his calendar. It is in the constitution. The reason we are fighting with Museveni is because he is breaking the constitution. He's breaking the Constitution. And everything that I in the Constitution is what we must protect. There must be elections every five years. Those elections must be free and fair. And the person who has won that election must be declared. That is what we are fighting for. So we don't need to wait to have that. That is why we are here. Let us build the capacity to fight. Let us build the momentum. Because that election gave us the momentum. That is why they spent billions of money trying to suffocate the momentum that was built in that bloody election. They can also be used as a tool to topple the system. Not this guy that we are going to wait for his announcement because they will never, he will never announce us as winners. That is a fact. But we are working towards forcing him to accept that we are winners because we are winners. <laughs> this revolution, lastly, on that matter of elections, is organic. None of you knew that Bobby Wine would be your leader. I believe when he sleeps, he also asks himself some questions. How this whole business is in how it started in his mind and how he ended up here. I know sometimes he poses that question within himself. But the revolution is organic. It's not, that's why we can't stop it. It is growing every day. And for me, I believe we should let it be organic. Let us handle events as they come. For as long as it is our timetable, not their timetable. I repeat this, it must not be their timetable, it must be our timetable. Of course, if you talk to the second today, it, and the power is back in your hands, still you can decide to organize ourselves in the elections of 2026. The challenge is that people think Museveni is going to be alive and around forever. No. 
They will even be there, you will see the bad news that is there. I did not want the good news. But uh, as a human being, the day you will get the good news that the man who has been disturbing this country is dead. I'm only working so hard for him to die, not the president of Uganda. <laughs> so for me, I believe that to answer you strictly and straight, let's not wait for 2026. We can talk of seven tomorrow, the other day. Let us major with the majors. However, the system should not just away us, should not just us away from the national calendar. Let me tell you what we benefit from processes of like elections. For example, they say we did not have support in Northern Iran. And we lost uh, they lost Olani. You know what they did in that election and also? You would not have seen the support we have if the secretary did not decide that whatever they are going to let them do, but let us demystify their deceit and propaganda. Because we are not allowed, I am speaking to you this freely, but I may not be allowed to speak like this in Serena to the young people. But in an election, they will allow me to go to Kavira Maido and pass the message of change and at least influence and inspire two or three that have never seen any of us or had this message. So we also use it as a momentum tool of knowledge to those places we have not fully penetrated. You have read about something called escapism in literature. Escapism is where somebody plays cards instead of eating lunch. Thinking that when you play the cards, the lunch will, the time of lunch will go by itself when you have run to the game of cards. But even after the cards, you will still need to, to eat. So we should not, we should be very, very, very keen not to act out of escapism. God bless you. People power. 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 And you be. Everywhere. Everywhere. And you be. Last
by one of the members of People Power. We are believing in democracy. If we believe to have democracy in the future for Uganda, then we have to practice democracy now. And when I'm as a concerned elder who saw my needs come to my country, we have them in turn. So for that reason, I'm saying, please, and it will be good for the Rwandese. And I tell you about that I have children that are paying tuition for that I have Rwandese. My nephews, my nieces. So my point is, please, let's address this issue. Because if we don't, it's going to be like in Congo. Right now in Congo, they're hunting down Rwandese. And in fact, I was talking to my half Rwandese child. I tell him maybe go to Toro because when things start around you, maybe a victim, people are very angry. So let us deal with the Rwandese. You Rwandese who are here and the members of this leadership here, do not stop us indigenous Ugandans from addressing the issue of your extremist Rwandese who's refugees who have taken over the government of Uganda. And are killing, have killed three, four million people. It's a big mistake. And so I'm requesting that this is to be addressed to the world, not only in Uganda, because I've found that the blockers are only working in Uganda. People naturally don't understand Uganda. People in Congo don't understand Uganda. They just want to do this for internal political consumption. Because that can be done. You do it for internal people in Uganda, but we want the Americans to know what's going on in Uganda. We want to know that Uganda situation is not a normal dictatorship. That the dictatorship there is a refugee takeover. The American government intentionally put a refugee group that they did in Niger. They put, they put an Arab, 0.8 Arabs in Niger. This is a new way of, of creating it because they know the native will not stand for it. They will not sell out their country. Because we have 31 million tons of gold. That's what we've been done. They want our gold. That's Thank you. Okay, so let us Thank you. Thank you. Now, please clap for Jose. He has I want to tell you two things. One, we should be very extremely careful. Extremely careful. Not to break the national greed in what we are chasing for. Number one, let me give you the statistic. Most of the Rwandese are in Indiana, Tioga, where she comes from, and other regions. We want square where they are. Because if they are living in Uganda, they are not living in an isolated Uganda. The problem we have in Uganda is Jenom Seven. You have described him properly, his origin, and I don't want to doubt because people say he's not a Ugandan and I also studied and I don't find where he's a Ugandan. <laughs> <laughs> now, just a minute. Yes, sir. Ongoing information. We should call a state a state. Okay. Thank you. What is on Floyd Musebe? What is on the podcast telling you Musebe is not a Ugandan? Thank you. So who are you to say that you don't know where he came from? No, 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 no. I, I, I have categorically stated that I have read. So where he got you from? Let me see what I've said again. I have read, I have not read anywhere yeah, that is a Ugandan. That is what I said. Yes. So it means I'm confirming that he's not <laughs> Because if I had read and I had seen that he's a Ugandan, I would say he is. So I was being polite to say he's not a Ugandan, but by using too much English. <laughs> now, <laughs> but I don't want my point to die out. They are, I pray I finish. We have a problem in Uganda. And the problem is general to say that. Before I look at his pride, God has given me the ability to identify the problem. The problem is you man called to say that. So I want to remove this man, whether he's Congolese, whether he's Chinese, whether he's Indian, whether he's Russian. I want to remove that man who is identified as to say that, and all his cronies. Because inclusive 
city of his colonies, the person who massacred the people in Kasese was a Welu. So should, 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 shall we leave a Welu? Because we are looking for a particular group of people. Everybody who has done heinous crimes against Ugandans, whatever tribe they are, they will pay. Let's not discriminate. I'm telling you, people who are doing big, bad things, some of them are our own. Yes. So we know the problem. Let's attack the problem. And the problem is Museveni. Whether it's Rwandese, whether it's Tusi, whether it's Chinese, whether it's what, is a problem. Let us handle him as the problem. And his cronies. Because we know them. God has given us the ability, we know the problem, to, 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 to call on so many other fights is to run away from the problem. The problem is Genom 7. With his background, whether it is Rwandese, whether it is what, is the problem. And I can tell you, folks, let me tell you, even if the Rwandans want to take over you, but they can't, we are big in number by population. Statistics are clear. And we have not stopped giving birth. Ugandans are still doing it well like they have done it before. <laughs> <laughs> so, for me, my problem, my problem as wife well is Genom 7. I don't look at who he is because it no longer matters to me. He is the problem and his people. And that is where our focus should be. In my considered opinion. Because I will not have, like he said, he has half, uh, he, have, he has half children. He calls them half, but he has children who are Randis. Okay? And I believe they subscribe to his understanding. Let us not disempower those who are with us in the fight. Let us focus to empower everybody for as long as they are with us. Our, 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 our accountability is anchored on Batula Gilakuchi. Batula Gilakuchi. Because some of those who have betrayed us are our own. Okay? So we should not isolate the uh, challenges we face. We should understand them, identify them, and once we have identified them, let's attack that issue to win over it. However, we have promised ourselves, being that you are in Soga, that we are going to also discuss it further. I, for me, I speak things the way I have understood them, and definitely we will have a lengthy discussion about that topic. And nobody should tell you that we'll keep quiet against the other side in Uganda. I am here telling you that Museveni murdered 54 people led by a commando unit from Somalia. If I can say that, then why can't I say any other person who has done it? Let us attack the problem on the front line. Let us not look for proxies. You know, there's no reason why you want to fight somebody very far when there's this one that you want to attack. Once we have removed Museveni, even these people who think that have been empowered by him, they will run in the morning. For us in Kampala, what we have done is to identify a property. Awani, Yafna Watia, Afna Meka. We have all those processes. You get my point? People power, 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 power. People power. They are very tired, they are side. People power, 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 power. People power. And you be everywhere. When the struggle is over, you mean it, you mean it. We shall wear the victors from, we shall wear the victors from, when the struggle is over, we shall wear the victors from, in the new Uganda. Many of you Takana, please come and, and, and speak at the congregation. Like this brother of mine, and for you, you'll allow me to say it. Sometimes, have find him as a Rwandese. But he's a Ugandan. He's a Mnyakole actually, not even a Rwandese at that. So some people, even me, one of the reasons I died every day tell people, you people are in Soga. Some people will say that because of my handsomeness that I am not say I thank you the ladies for the article. That's good.
Give it up. So I said that to assure them that if you want to know how handsome and so that is, then I have a few comments. So now, sometimes I'm feeling it is disempowering <laughs> when you are attacked falsely and you are in the front line. And I want to implore us really examine by judging people by their actions, not by their power. It is very, very important that I wanted to make that point and say it with clarity. At this time, allow me to invite my brother here. He's going to give us a very strong presentation. Please listen to him. Uh, because for us who have got the chance to listen to him, I've always got wisdom from his presentation. So, it will be easy for us for him to go away. He is always a man in the background. But he will be cheating of us if he does not share uh, whatever he has to share. So, my brother, you have, uh, uh, I know we have given you much time, but we have cut it now to about 15 minutes. Thank you very much. People power. power. Our power. People power. NUP. Everywhere. Everywhere. NUP. Our visiting comments. My name is Benjamin Katana, like I have been introduced. And this evening, I have the honor to be here, first of all, not like why the only happy because they have had the chance to go to White House, but because we are here to discuss very important business of removing a dictatorship from Uganda. I'm also very happy to be here because of the critical role that you have been playing in this struggle. The diaspora community, not necessarily of today, but since time immemorial, has been a very critical player in the liberation struggles of Africa. And after most of the running ideologies about African liberation, like Pan Africanism, originated from the diaspora. So it is very important that you have been playing this role, but it's not surprising because of many factors. And one of them being the exposure that you have had that many people back at home have not had. You know what it means to live in a country where there is justice. You know what it means to live in a country where there is inclusivity. You know how to live in a country where institutions work. Some of our brothers and sisters have not had that chance. But there are those who have had the chance to live in these communities, but they have chosen to ignore what happens back at home. So for doing the right thing, we thank you and we are very proud of you. So today I have been given a responsibility to talk about a subject that we are all familiar with, that we speak about every day. But to lead us in a discussion about the nature of the dictatorship that we are dealing with in Uganda and how we can add another gear to disempowering that dictatorship. But we must note that fighting the dictatorship is not an event. And in this room, I have seen veterans of the liberation struggle in Uganda. I may not need to mention names. They have been at it. They have not given up. And those that infect the dictatorship, they would actually want you to give up. So this subject we are all familiar with. We have discussed it time and again and talked about it. But you see, like the devil, what is evil? All religious, religious sects talk about the devil. They talk about evil. They never get tired. Because also the devil has not rest. So while we have talked about the dictatorship and we are trying to diagnose and understand it, even the dictatorship does not rest, so we must never rest from talking about it until we have been able to dismantle it and research Uganda on the path of democratic governance where there is justice and inclusivity. 
And I'm not discussing this as an expert, but we'll be sharing ideas. And so we are dealing with a dictatorship that has had close to 40 years of investment in an infrastructure that enables it to thrive. And so you have an individual, there has been a fusion between the state of Uganda and the person of General Seven. That is why, you see, when we have elections, you ask yourself the army, the police, the electoral commission, and all these agencies of the state, mm -hmm. they are active participants on the side of one of the individuals contesting in an election. Why? Because General Seven has become the state of Uganda. So when you you are a legitimate opponent against him. You are criminalizing. You are looked at as a criminal who is now fighting in the state of Uganda. That's why we have our supporters today being charged in the general court martial for prison and other related cases. Why? Because they have taken a position against the person who has become the state of Uganda. And so for us, and many times people ask questions that you people of opposition, why is it that you are talking about the seven, the seven this, the seven that? It's because, and my brother here was talking about the Freedom Charter, which is a very brilliant idea. But all of these ideas, there is a lot of work. Today, what is left of our constitution talks about so many fundamental rights. But because there is a system which has rendered the law useless, these rights cannot be enforced. He controls the police, he controls the courts, he controls the DPP. So even when you are arrested for no reason and taken to police, the police will not take a decision in accordance with the law, but in accordance with the wishes of the one who controls the police. When you apply the same to the DPP, Director of Public Prosecutions, they will not give advice on the basis of the law, but on the basis of the person who controls it. When your matter is taken to court, the decision is not going to be made on the basis of the law, but on the basis of the wishes of the one who controls it. So that is the situation that we are dealing with. So all these brilliant ideas are very good, but first, we must create an environment that will enable these ideas to be implemented. Enable these ideas, as they don't remain ideas on paper, but there is a conducive political environment that enables laws and policies to be meaningful. And so, we also need to realize that the, the direction of how the dictatorship manifests in Uganda is not a unique case. That is how all dictatorships span out. If you have been uh, a close follower of governments in countries that have gone through a similar trajectory like ours, you can take an example of DRC or Zaire Andamutu that he controlled everything. And those who supported him and believed him thought he was invincible, that not even the death would take him, not any rebel group would take him, not any political organization would take him out of power. But as we speak today, Mobutu's history. Yes. Yes. In our neighbor today, in Uganda, people draw lessons from Kenya. They praise Kenya. But my sister here will bear with me. Before coming into force of the 2010 constitution in Kenya, especially under the days of President Moi. Moi was the state of Kenya. And he did not leave power because he chose to. But because people like you, people like us, organized and built pressure that compelled him to say, now I'm negotiating for my exit. I'm using these examples to show us that much as, because dictatorships thrive on perception, 
No me de la pena de la única de la libertad. But regardless of that perception, for us to know that if we do what we have to do, like we are doing today, and in other avenues, then the dictatorship, which we perceive to be very strong, will crumble like a pack of cards. So it is uh, very important that we understand how dictatorships normally manifest and what the name of them strive. And one of them is the reliance on force and violence. I think that one needs no emphasis. All of us here have seen what has been happening in Uganda. Even if we draw examples from the last elections of 2021, just as an example, because what changed maybe is the magnitude. As far as 1996, when the late Dr. Semogoyen contested in the Temple, they have had massive violations of human rights. In 2001, massive violations of human rights. People died for choosing a side. In 2006, the same story. In 2011, the same story. What changed this time around is the magnitude and largely on account of increased pressure. When the dictatorships and regime will want to overlook legitimacy, like the one in Uganda has lost legitimacy, they resort to about three things. One of them is violence, the other one is money and patronage, and, 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 and the third one is money. They are several, but those are the, are, the, are the key. So, violence and force, and, and, and so, but the beauty is that this force. Regardless of how normally it is deployed, eventually, once the people are organizing, they overwhelm these dictatorships, and even the enforcers who have been helping them to enforce this violence, abandon them and run away. And I think we have seen these examples in so many countries. The other way it, through which dictatorships thrive, like ours in Uganda, is patronage. That instead of focusing on serving people, instead of deploying money on services, instead of investing in hospitals and schools, instead of investing in infrastructure, invest in individuals, a few individuals and use these few individuals to influence the many who are not benefiting from the government. That's why you see the government in Uganda every now and then is creating constituencies, is creating districts. If you want to serve the people in an area, what they need is a hospital, what they need is a road, what they need is a good school, what they need are services. But you create a district and have a, this person has become a chairman. Then there is a pistol. There is another DC that is a chain of battery that is always on the media during campaigns to make sure that they ring for him, to make sure that he wins regardless of whether he has support or not. So that battery system is deliberate and one of the, of the, of the, 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 the key intention is to make sure that they use that battery system to manipulate the rest of the population side with him. And get more members of parliament. Exactly. The other one is the uh, manipulation, which they normally do through deception. They will pit people against each other, organizations against each other. Uh, my brother was here was talking about parties that we now know we are given money fight with the NUP. Supposedly the parties in the opposition. And they will create rumors and bring them with NUP against other parties. They will take rumors with other parties so that these parties, instead of coming together to work together, to confront, challenge and defeat the dictatorship, they are always at war with each other. And I think many times you have seen it 
when people that are supposed to be in the same group, same organization, the oppressed people, are up in arms against each other. And for them, they are just standing there laughing. Say so these people who are fighting against each other, how can they be trusted in the leadership of the country? And they know that there are so many Ugandans who are going to listen to that, that reception and fall for it. So it is important that we are always alert and we also have a responsibility to sensitize other citizens of Uganda not to fall for that reception and manipulation. Of course, the other aspect is money and uh, the circumstances in Uganda have been that because we have a person who is the de facto governor, who is everything, he can choose how much money should be released to go to an individual organization for purposes of hiring support, not for purposes of services. You have seen people at the rallies, they are, they, they are ferried. If you have a rally in Masini, the whole of Unyoro will be ferried to a rally in Masini, in buses, they are fed, they are given transport to the van, and you get an impression that he has support. Because Matters is planning to rig an election, and I think you have been seeing it now. The so called birthday parties and other events of the sun. It's not because they think that he needs the people to win, but they want to project an impression that he has support. And when the meeting takes place, they say, but it was very clear from the beginning. Everywhere he has gone, people have welcomed him, have supported him, so the results are not surprising. So we need to be always aware and on the guard against that. And while the diaspora has been a very quick player in the liberation struggles, I think with the emergence of people power, we became a very big target of that money. There are people running around the cities with money and promises because they know the capacity that you have to support or frustrate their efforts of restoring the life residents in Uganda. Mm -hmm. The other aspect is dividing and rule. And this manifests in so many ways. The, today, our country is fractured. People look at themselves in terms of the tribe, not because it helps them, but that's the environment that the dictator has created. Mm -hmm. People ask me that you are in Nyangori, how can you not support the settlement? But they don't ask, for example, General Kakumba Wamara, why he supports the settlement. <laughs> work yes. is that they humiliate people for a long time, makes them that people lose confidence in themselves. Yes. That someone thinks that a Mnyangore cannot support a Muganda, but there are thousands of Uganda working for Museveni. Mm -hmm. How people lose pride in that level, think that another tribe cannot see value in, in a person from that tribe. <laughs> so that divide and rule only helps him. It doesn't tell anybody else. Today, after losing support, because for a, for a long time, the system survived with support from the rule of Ghana. And they were very confident that even if West Germany is in Kampala, in Mukono town, in Masaka, in Mukomansi, they will vote for the system. But after 2021, hmm. the dynamics changed. That is why we focus now is on the greater north. Because he knows if you can manipulate people in Ankore. Because you see, during campaigns, we would go to the west and people and the <laughs> Mama Jere will tell you. And people would say, but they are saying that they want to chase our children from Kampala. Because that's the lie that they were sold. <laughs> but uh, none of these children were, were brought to Kampala by the and they came on their own. <laughs> but that's what they told them. The other day I saw in one of the districts in the north that they were chasing 
Bagan who own his who own land business. I said, but these people, their brothers and sisters own homes in Kampala. So if the people in Central were to retaliate, where would that leave the country? But these are victims of the manipulation of the dictator. Because if people can stand together and start asking questions that are based on issues, then you will be disempowered. But if people are lost in those squibbles, he's the only beneficiary. Mm -hmm. And during campaigns, it was very common. And people would say, oh, the people in Uganda are supporting the President Chagrani because he's a Mugani. <coughs> but he's not the first Uganda to run for president. Mm -hmm. But in all these elections, you have been winning in Uganda when they were Uganda running for president. Mm -hmm. And so they had defined all sorts of reasons, further defined the country, that people, when he goes to Angola, they vote for him on the basis of saying he's giving them protection. Mm -hmm. When he goes to the north, he's protecting them from the people of this side, and, and, and like that. So he's able. And so we have the duty to make sure that we continuously engage the population and cause enhanced civic competence for people to be able to discern and know that this is what we want and what we are interested in is what this person and his government or her government are promising us and are capable of doing, not because he's my neighbor. The other aspect that enables the dictatorship to thrive is infiltration. And I think this one needs no emphasis. You, you see now what is happening in one of our sister parties. People are saying money was brought, we know where it came from, and now that party is fighting. Not fighting with the dictator, but fighting against each other. Mm because the organization has been infiltrated. Hmm. And he will create that infiltration, but also make sure that it works for him. I always joke with some colleagues that during the towards, <laughs> I don't know if this is information, that, towards the, the voting for 2021, there were many back and forth meetings with our colleagues in the opposition. And in one of the, after the meetings, I joked with, the, with our president. I said, if anything leaked from this meeting, I would be the first suspect. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm alive with the realities of our politics. But after the elections, one of the key participants in that meeting, who was not a Minyakone like me, was appointed a minister. In seven cabinets. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, and I'm not saying it that, but for him, infiltration works for him, but he will still use it also to cause unnecessary suspicion. Yes. You treat each other with suspicion, yes. but even the people he's working with sometimes are not necessarily those that share identity with him or anything else. So, you know, they, they, they say that our wound is for our arm. We need to be able to know how, who our allies are and who our enemies are. And like our president many times emphasizes, let people be judged by their actions. And so, I hope I'm still on time. I just do one Two minutes. Okay. Okay, maybe I will leave out some of the things. But how do we progress? How do we disempower the dictatorship? Because you realize that the, that system of patronage it is largely facilitated by, by institutions. Churches, cultural institutions, trade unions that should be the vanguard of liberation. So how do we make sure that we are able to bypass his stooges in these institutions and we deal 
with the people directly. I think that's one of the things that we need to focus on so much. That we are able to disempower these students and work with the people directly and overwhelm him. For him, he's comfortable that I have put this for that pastor, I have put this for this country this, uh, leader, but then we weaken them by fasting and dealing with the people. Number two, to expose, isolate, and weaken the dictatorship. And there was a question here about 2026 and things of that nature. I think for us, we are in the business of removing a dictator. If we are able to achieve it today, we are in good. If we are able to achieve it two days from today, we are in good. If by 2026 or any other election, that has not been achieved and there is an avenue for doing so, I think people should not shy away from doing that. The, and so, by, expose, by exposing the protests that took place here today and other things of that nature, using social media, uh, you comrades have been very active going to these very critical offices, sharing information so that people get to understand the person they are dealing with to help us to, to further weaken him. The other one is starving the, 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 the predatory system of resources. People, once the person has been fully exposed and the institutions, as someone here was talking about the billions of money that the dictatorship gets and uses to further entrench itself, if it can be served with such resources through deliberate action, then it also further weakens it. The other aspect is uh, for us to have clarity of purpose. As individuals involved in this struggle, we must be very clear on what our purpose is, what we want to achieve. And then the, 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 the other important discussion becomes how we get there. So we must be able to break down what removing a dictatorship in Uganda is and what we want to achieve after we have done that. And then we are able to cascade it down to the last person on the radar that it is a shared idea by the leaders and those that they did. You are starting to tell me that today is. <laughs> Comrade, this is a discussion that we can have for the whole day and night. But because of the time constraints, I will stop here for now. I thank you for listening to me. And I hope you I hope that my description of this gentleman you have had for the gift. But we have had him, I will not speak for him. Very smart. Um, let's have three uh, reactions. I'll ask Marvin from Boston, uh, our lady here. I'll, because of time, time, I'll take her. Thank you. Not you, Mama. Ah. Please, <laughs> please come. Okay. All the first mm -hmm. I had loved to give all of you, but let us choose her. Mabin mm -hmm. is a fellow opponent. Forgive me and her. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying I'm giving you the opportunity. The oh, okay. yeah. lady is only you and her. Please. But we hear you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, everything you do. Uh, yeah. You are the people on the ground, and uh, you know, I'm all of you. So, uh, my one question today is uh, let's say a day comes when we are victorious. And we, you know, we are wearing our crown of victory. Um, what is next? Uh, can you walk me through the first 100 days?
things. I like to go to the future. Hello, hi, my name is Gamal Nankone. Thank you so much for all the work that you're doing in Uganda. I can't imagine living under a dictatorship and being in fear of your life uh, from day one to day 364. My question is regarding the youth. Uh, before the elections and shortly after the elections, you could tell that you are interested and invested. Um, mostly on social media and you read comments like uh, we're in the struggle, human struggle, and they're making fun of it. And for me, Katu, uh, uh, Wamala's case of being shot and being transported for a border border, I'm a physician, and somebody who has had gunshot wounds should never have been transported that way. So to see you making fun of people who are trying to advocate for their lives, is so discouraging in a way that makes me think that these people even worth being liberated from a dictatorship. But on the other hand, these are people who have grown up under uncertainty and maybe they don't know better. So what does people power, what does you have in plans to galvanize people so that the same enthusiasm they had for changing leadership um, continues beyond just close to Elections and post-elections. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. The, the first question about after we have removed the dictator, what's next? I, the question of the first 100 days maybe will be definitely answered by the president. I don't want the question of money. But the National Unity Platform people power that we all subscribe to is about the, the power dynamics in Uganda today is about establishing a democratic dispensation. Running a government that is people centered, where there is justice, there is accountability, that the actions of leaders are subject to the wishes of the population. But there's also accountability for action. It is about equal opportunity. The, one of the problems, and I've written previously uh, written about it, one of the reasons that explains the, the, the growing tribalism in our country is the, because there is a feeling that opportunities are being accessed on account of identity. So if my, my identity does not qualify me, Exactly, that you know, you people will look at your tribe before they can give you a job. People will look at your religion before they can give you a job. So one of the things is equal opportunity. Is that we are able to eliminate that uh, that discrimination and, and, and things like that. The other thing is inclusion. The, uh, the, the opportunities in business and everywhere should not be for a chosen few. The other aspects, are, they are simple. There's also the question of business environment, so that you can be able, for the economy to be able to thrive, you must put in place a conducive business environment where there is no corruption, there is no extortion, the business processes are very fast and things like that. I don't want to. Uh, then the other thing is about uh, you know quality education, quality uh, and education really that is that is able to produce people who can compete in the global markets today. So that our children are going to Middle East as expatriates, not as casual laborers, Because there are also such job opportunities of expatriates. But because we don't have the skills, we must give those opportunities for those people whose countries have prepared them to compete in that field. And for us, we have only been prepared to go and do the cleaning jobs. So we must be able to have a shift on the quality of education that we give. And this quality education should be accessible by all. Whether my father is poor, whether I'm an orphan, I should be able to access quality education that prepare, prepare me to compete equitably with other people in the job market. 
Uh, so maybe I think the other things the president will talk about them tomorrow. But the other thing is about the and, and to me what what she said that people now things like things struggle. They are using them to mock those that are involved in the struggle. And like I mentioned earlier, I don't know if I could just talk about it. One one of the things that the regime the, the dictatorship strive on is propaganda. And, and so, and I think what so earlier mentioned, that when you come for engagements like these ones, people will say these ones are going to marry men. Hmm. The regime people know it is not the case, but they want to make, they want to create a distance between the leaders and the people they lead. Mm -hmm. Dictatorship strive by denying people leadership. Mm -hmm. Either humiliate their leaders, compromise them, kill them, or make sure that you discredit them. So that propaganda is meant to discredit them. That's why some of our people have fallen for that propaganda. Yeah. If there is a way they, they say, ah, these ones are not in the struggle. But should the people get married? Should the people get married? If you post a picture when you are dressed well, they say you look at these ones that are in the struggle. But should people who are involved in the struggle not walk, should they walk naked? <laughs> but I think our job, I think our, our job is first of all to discard and know that these people, this is propaganda. And then our other responsibility as leaders is to make sure that we push back and tell people the truth and always be ahead of, we shouldn't come out to, to defend ourselves against falsehood. When they put us on the defense, then they have won. We should move ahead of them and give people information, say that there is no information gap. And I think it's, it's, it's much earlier. We have some right here in the United States. Yes. They, they're dividing us and ruling. And it's happening right here. Yeah. In so, this so room. We must deliver it. Yes work towards making sure that there are no information gaps because these youth you are talking about have been manipulated and deceived. Why? Maybe because there are some information gaps and we must always be ahead of them. The best analogy to explain how we deal with these people is like the one of the criminals and the enforcement. One must always be a step ahead of the other. If the criminal is ahead of the enforcement agencies, the crime will take place. When the enforcement agencies are ahead of the criminal, the crime will not take place. Yes. So for us, we are the forces of light. Right. The regime and its propagandists are the forces of darkness. We should not give them a chance to thrive by not sharing the light of the I thank you. Please summarize 
get to the main point so we can give everyone an opportunity to present. Uh, so, with that said, I would like to give an opportunity to our first presenter, the Ohio chapter. So we have presentations being made by different chapters, and the top three chapters will receive an award on Sunday. So when you come here, please do your best job, no pressure, uh, but try to give time. So time is, I think 90% of the credit is going to time giving. Uh, if uh, Professor Andrew allows that. Uh, so we'll have Ohio chapter go next. Uh, if you have any PowerPoint that you want to use, Please make sure before you come here you communicate to, to our team in the corner, the AV team, so they have it loaded uh, in their system. So Ohio chapter, come, present yourself, and briefly walk us through what your presentation is. And I also like to request that we will need your final paper to go to uh, Professor Andrew Bibi uh, and Professor Sidney. So thank you very much for your patience. Uh, I know we are here, we have been here for a couple of hours, hang in there. I think this is a very important discussion we are having, and we hope to hear from all our presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you to our team from Uganda for your, those powerful presentations. We are very happy to have you here. So let's give a chance for the diaspora to also engage with you. So my request is for you to listen to some of the ideas they have, and then we can find a way um, my sorry, I, I really want to, to request that we take this session very seriously. I I know the experience of sitting and listening and talking is not for the experience, but let us give Uganda this time. Let's deliberate about our country and listen to each other such that we do not have again by the time we have finished this session. I see everybody has moved up. Let's give this stuff, this process, the seriousness it deserves because we are here and what we are doing, not taking for granted. This is where the answer of Uganda is, not anywhere else. Thank you. When you see the young people on the streets 
communities of different nations today, part of what is driving them is anger. Anger because the relationship that, uh, that exists between whoever they think is supporting the regime has been very exploitative. Mm -hmm. So they are left in poverty. And as the anger grows and boils, the same thing that is happening in those parts of, of the world is happening in Uganda. And you can feel it. So we are meeting at a very interesting time where there are different parts moving. You see the wars going on in Ukraine, the uprisings in Africa, the rumbles in Uganda, and uh, this is a good time for U.S. to re-examine how they have been handling the issues of trade and investment. And uh, our main charge from this presentation is that we are where we are as Uganda because of the group that is in charge. It has failed, you know? It has concentrated on security, whatever they define as security, but has been very corrupt, they, uh, has had a lot of nepotism, has not been creative in developing and rethinking what the economy needs. And there's no way that any additional investment could be given to the same people who have been creating the havoc and we expect different uh, changes. Now, Uganda and US relate in trade on different uh, trade. Um, they relate uh, through trade and investment framework agreements. We have things some of you know about the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA. Some of you have heard about Prosper Africa, but most of the policies that deal with trade are implemented through the US Embassy and other agencies that operate within the embassy. So if we are going to have the changes, we have to say, we have to ask, why has Museveni failed? What are the challenges that have led to this failure? And how can the current trade and investment relationship be redefined? So one of the things that uh, I'm just going to go to what we identified so that we can save some time. Uh, one of the things that we identified is that we have, this is a good time to rethink and reimagine re the trade because you can have a young population which is potential consumers and market for goods. Also, Uganda is able to have a, a language of English spoken, so it's easier to communicate for across the border. At least I'm talking about US specific. I'm not trying to denigrate any other language. And we have a population that is yearning for democracy. We also have US adversaries that are trying to make movements into you. Uganda. We have China playing a role, we have Russia playing a role, and in out of self-interest, the US should really, really think hard on how it proceeds. So these are some of the things we suggested. We suggested that normally the level of engagement between the US and Uganda is at a higher level, where you have the diplomats coming and planting a big flag. They deal with the dictator. As long as the dictator and his fellow bandits are ready and happy, kind of, the other people, we matter, but really do not matter. In a way, that is taking away the foundation for the future from both sides. So our suggestion was that instead of dealing at a higher ground, a higher level, exclusively, we need to get back to the bottom. For those people who believe in economic development and community development, you know that you have to grow everything from the bottom up. 
So much as you relate with the trade minister, what are you doing with the businesses on the ground? Can we form those business relationships between businesses in Uganda and businesses on, on, in the US? Can we form those, some of you know about like the sister relationships between cities? Can we work on that? Can we work on relationships between institutions? Maybe not for every village because it gets expensive, class, but maybe at a district level. So that the chamber, most Ugandans, if you ask them that who are involved in business and uh, uh, of any kind of trade, they have never heard about the opportunities that they could benefit from because the government deliberately used this information to a selected connected few. So if people knew what is going on, even in my hometown, maybe they would have a way to compete. How do I get my goods? How do I get them marketed? Um, the other part that we suggested was we need to look at the ethics of trade. How is the US doing trade in Uganda? Are we just getting whatever we want? That is the US. Are you, is the US is getting what it wants and doesn't really care about the masses that are displaced, land, ground, uh, gross human rights resources? Just like there is a, a fair trade, if these issues of ethics were central, then a business would be thinking twice of who am I getting into business with? We got, uh, I, I was supposed to show this, but uh, I, I, I will not show it, but uh, we got one of the papers from the recent, recent summit that Uganda had in Chicago. And when you look at the list of businesses, first of all, they were led by the son-in-law of the president, Audrey Krago. Is he the best? Person to negotiate on behalf of Uganda, and the list, when you look at it, it was selected few businesses. But these are not the businesses that employ the bulk of Ugandans. The bulk of Ugandans are, are, are invested, uh, engaged in issues like agriculture, small business. So if you really want to redefine and get long lasting commitment to Ugandans, not Uganda then you have to focus on the people who are at the bottom and more, more inclusive of everybody. Um, okay. Then we needed to look at uh, improvements in the supply chain along the way. Then there is need to value the demographics of the nation. We need to collect more accurate data of what is going on. But to us, most important, I think this was one of the issues that uh, we thought about uh, with the diaspora. We have a central role to play, but in spite of the richness of U.S. is diaspora, they have not taken sufficient advantage of that. Can you imagine if the connections were not only made through the ambassador? that they were made at a village level. Because if I do took a census now, there's almost a person from every district in this room. This could be very multiplicative. And also, if there was a way to complement the investment that the diaspora makes personally in a village, as they match businesses' investment, maybe the US should think about matching what we invest as the diaspora in our communities. So, in the interest of time, thank you so much for listening to me. I'm inviting your discussion, and uh, those are some of the ideas.
for cyber security. Uh, cyber security awareness and best practices for non-technical users. With Mr. Mutiaba representing the Minnesota chapter. Madam Harris, for 11 minutes, Mr. Mutiaba, I hope you can beat that. <laughs> Security managers, 
you know, incident response teams, and so on. But that's not um, that's not who you are, I suppose. So let us talk about who is at risk. Everybody who is here who has who is connected to the internet is at risk. And that's anyone who works in banking, anyone who works in tech, you know, in, in techos, in law firms, in charities, oil and gas, anyone who has data. What are the threats? And you can see threat actors, activists, organized crime, now state sponsored um, security risks. I will discuss that really in a minute because that's going to be very important to the people, especially the people who are coming from Uganda. Uh, you have malware, you have uh, social engineering, you have uh, phishing, and top cyber security risks, as you can see, mobile phone malware. Uh, is on top of, is among the top five. And that's where almost everybody here uh, lies. So we'll discuss uh, why we need to make sure that everybody has awareness of these risks and what you can do to protect yourself, to protect your data and your information. The leading threats are sp spyware, viruses, worms, phishing, Trojan horses, social engineering, rootkits, botnets, and zombies. Now, spyware especially is very important because that's where we can have governments, like in Uganda or anywhere else, they tap your phone, they tap the network, they can plant malware on your computer, they can plant malware on your phone without you knowing, and it will monitor everything you do and give them back information. So you have to be very careful when you, I will give you ideas as to how you can protect yourself. Uh, viruses, those are programs that multiply and those are just called, meant to cause damage. So, uh, worms, <laughs> logic bombs, Trojan horses, uh, social engineering now, this is especially very important because that's how people get your passwords. You are not supposed to share your password with anybody. And make sure when you send your passwords, they have to be strong passwords. Phishing, never click on any of those um, links that come in your email. If you do not know who is sending you that email, don't click on that link because someone is on the other side waiting for you to click. And as soon as you click, their computer is waiting to get a connection to yours. And as soon as it happens, they have complete control over your computer. So be very careful of those. That's the number one problem that we have. And it hasn't been solved. Different companies like Google are trying all the, their best to make, to put controls in there so that when you click on that, at least there's notification to the technical systems back in the back end that will stop that those phishing attacks. You can see here that this is a good example where someone will send a link, it takes you to a place that looks like a bank, looks like your US bank site. You put in all your information, but you're putting it in the, in the wrong site. And right there, you have given them your ID and your password. So, man in the video attack, that's where you are the victim, and someone is online on the line. As you're sending your information, someone else is able to tap into it. So, you have to make sure that any connection you make is encrypted. It, it has to say HTTPS on top. Uh, Rootkits are just computer programs that are planted on your, on your phone, on your smartphone, on your computer. 
that will um, that will give them a back door into your computer. So someone is able to just get in your phone, do everything they want, and you, you may not even see that something is happening. Uh, this is especially important for people uh, in politics where uh, someone can work, for example, with uh, MTN. And MTN will send you a security update. It will include that kind of rootkit that will give someone a backdoor into your computer. And you won't know it. And they will be able to listen to everything you said, all the meetings you plan, everything you're trying to do. They'll be able to, to know what's going on. So, uh, password cracking. This is where somebody is able to crack, uh, to get the, the database of your passwords. And as you can see, it only takes, uh, it, it only takes a few minutes with a very powerful computer to be able to get back an encrypted password and put it back in raw form where you can actually read it. Then go through this quick because I see uh, that they're trying to look at it. So the best practices are to make sure that you protect not only your phone, but you have to have a holistic control system that puts in consideration the hardware, the operating system, and and so I will give you ideas of how. You can first make sure you log in onto applications that are secure. Your host is your computer, it has to be um, secure. And I'll uh, give you ideas here. You, have, you must have antivirus on your, on your phone. I don't know how many of you have your antivirus on your phones. Because if you don't, it is very likely that someone will come and get into your phone and do whatever they want and you won't know. So make sure you go into, uh, if you use Google Play, whatever you use, make sure that you have uh, antivirus. Make sure that your computer has a, a firewall and that it's standard. Because if it's not, uh, someone will be able to get on the network and get into your computer or your phone without a problem. Uh, protect your operating system, make sure you have security updates. Now, like I said, there is still a risk with that because the state can work with uh, MTN with those telcos and send you uh, security updates that are, that, that are being planted with a toolkit, like we mentioned. Uh, use strong passwords, and that means if you can, make them at least 12 characters. Uh, I will give you ideas about making how to make strong passwords, but uh, I think we are running out of time. Um, so this thing about multi-factor authentication, I'll go back to the real thing. Make sure that when, when you have your social social network accounts, that if you have Facebook, if you have Google, go and turn on multi-factor authentication because. It is very easy. They have they are based on many data breaches, and in these data breaches, we have had uh, myself. My data was breached by Facebook, and when I go into the website there, I'll show it to you. It's called Have I Been Pawned? It tells me that these are all the breaches where my account was included, and I'll see. It and I go and change my password right away. Because that means that is what they call the dark web. Someone will go and buy your information and try to get into your computer. So this guy was in India trying to get into my Facebook account, but then he was not able to because he did not have my phone. And my